From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Congressman Kurt Schrader is currently serving his sixth term in the United States House of Representatives. He represents Oregon's fifth congressional district. The swing district includes all of Marion, Polk, Lincoln, and Tillamook counties, as well as most of Clackamas and small portions of Multnomah and Benton counties. And he's facing one of his toughest primaries yet, with a strong challenge from the left by Milwaukee Mayor Mark Gamba. We'll talk to Mayor Gamba in the second half of this show. Kurt Schrader was first elected to Congress in 2008. He's a farmer and retired veterinarian. Before he was elected to Congress, Schrader served in the Oregon legislature, first in the House and then in the Senate. He is currently on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, which oversees a number of issues ranging from health care to the environment. He's a member of the Blue Dog Coalition and the founding member of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. Welcome to my first guest, 5th District Congressman Kurt Schrader. Congressman Schrader, welcome back to Straight Talk. Thank you, Laurel. This is a little different format. <laughs> it, it certainly is. Well, thanks for joining us there from D.C. Let's start with the campaign. You're facing a challenge, a strong challenge in the primary from progressive Democrat Milwaukee Mayor Mark Gamba. What is the number one reason why you think voters should reelect you to a seventh term in the 5th District? because I've been very effective, uh, one of the most effective members of the United States Congress that represents a very diverse district, uh, one where it's tough to win, quite frankly, as a Democrat. Uh, we've been able to bridge that uh, urban-rural divide, uh, which is so prevalent in our state, but uh, we, we've been able to bridge that with the way we operate. Uh, we've been able to represent uh, the suburban urban portions as well as the, uh, the coastal and Marion County agricultural portions. I think that's huge. Uh, yeah, we've been able to pass a disaster funding bill for wildfires so that hopefully we're not gonna have those horrendous things we saw, what, just a couple summers ago. Uh, we were a leader in the ACA back when healthcare for, uh, for everybody was you know, kind of a very novel concept and I nearly lost my first reelection as a result of that. Uh, we've got special education funding increases. We're a leader in that arena, workforce, uh, CTE, brought the Seattle NOAA fleet down to uh, Newport. 205 is now a highway of national significance. We've been very, very effective. And to get any progress or be progressive, you gotta get the job done. Let's talk about the pandemic that is top of mind for most people right now. We're taping this on Thursday afternoon. And this morning, a whistleblower, the ousted vaccine chief, Dr. Rick Bright, testified today before the committee that you sit on, the House Committee on Energy and Commerce's Health Subcommittee. He said this country was not as prepared as we should have been for the coronavirus, and we missed early warning signs, and that if we don't develop a national coordinated response based in science soon, that we could see the darkest winter in modern history. History. Congressman, what's your assessment of the federal government response? How concerned are you? And what do you think we should be doing? Well, we came at it too late. We were unprepared. I think uh, Dr. Bright is spot on with that. Uh, since the, the efforts back in 2006 with the H1N1, uh, President George Bush uh, shined a light on the need for uh, a stockpile of protective gear, be alert, be ready to develop and respond uh, to these different types of uh, disease threats that we're going to see. I mean, the world has gotten to be much smaller. People travel uh, and we were unprepared. Matter of fact, the current administration was cutting back on some of our public health priorities, some of our public health funding. Uh, we need to do a much better job. I'm hopeful if anything good comes out of this horrible pandemic that we will sit down, buckle down and be prepared. Uh, we also had testimony from uh, 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 Mr. Bowen, who uh, is a mask manufacturer in Texas. Uh, he made the statement for 30 million bucks, we could have had that huge 3 billion stockpile of face masks that we needed for this epidemic. Uh, and you know, that's a lot of money, but compared to the trillions we're spending right now, yeah, I think it would have been money well spent. Let's talk about those trillions of dollars and the economic crisis that has resulted from this pandemic. Congress has passed trillions of dollars in relief packages, but a report this week shows the income inequality gap has widened, that low income earners and minorities are especially hard hit by this pandemic. And as far as small businesses, the Washington Post reports this week that 4 million small businesses got emergency loans from the Small Business Administration, but that's a small fraction of the 30 million 
million small businesses in this country, many of them in Oregon, that didn't get any money. Congressman, do you think that Congress did enough to make sure money got to the people and the businesses who really need it? Well, it's an iterative process, Laura. We've never done this before. And I'm actually very proud of how we've rolled out these packages. They've been bipartisan. Uh, everyone's been on board. Uh, first time ever we've had to deal with that in our lifetimes. Uh, putting the 10 billion bucks aside right away uh, within a, a week of the first case in Oregon, for instance, to develop vaccines, do therapeutics, get diagnostics, get our healthcare providers what they need, followed up by the Families First Act, trying to make sure that if you're unemployed or needed to take leave, you could get that, and that your employers, your small business employers, could get tax credits to do that. And when we rolled out the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loans that you referred to as part of the small business part of the CARES uh, Act that we passed, uh, you know, unfortunately, some of the bigger chain type of operations that qualify technically took some of that money. Uh, we got the secretary to push back on that, uh, making sure the publicly uh, traded corporations could not be eligible. And in the second tranche of money going out to small businesses actually went to small businesses. Matter of fact, SBA reports that the balance was flipped the other way where more small businesses actually had access. They actually shut down their website to large banks who operate obviously with bigger corporations to make sure the small business loans could get through. And we carved out money specifically at my request and others to come from small business towns and regions like ours uh, that it would be only small community banks, credit unions, community development financial institutions that could get this, this carve out money and it's worked. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is trying to get another relief package through another few trillion dollars. The president has said that is DOA because it includes a vote by mail portion of the legislation. What's the status? Do you think we'll see another relief package? Oh, I'm sure we'll see one coming out of the House. Uh, it may not have a lot of horsepower, as you alluded to, over in the Senate. And, you know, we just spent $3 trillion, Laurel. I, I just think our viewers need to understand $3 trillion. Number one, we don't have that money. That's on the United States credit card, the taxpayer's credit card. Two, it's twice what we usually spend in a year, in a year, for all our expenses for the U.S. government in our discretionary area. That's all of U.S. defense, all of our uh, non-defense uh, domestic spending, healthcare, education, transportation, economic development. So I think we want to be very careful about how we go forward. And to your point, make sure that the, the folks that we want to benefit from this actually do. You know, it's the small businesses that really need the help. Those folks who have been easily under 500 employees, I'd say, under 25 employees. That's most of the businesses in my district and in our state. We got to make sure they're the ones getting the money. We're trying to extend some of the deadlines that uh, to make it easier for these businesses to actually use some of the PPE money that we've got, work on the mix of ingredients. We're learning things as we roll this out. I'm on the phone. I'm doing Zoom constantly with folks trying to figure out what are the holes, what are the problems we need to do. So I might be a little, I think it's made probably a little premature to spend another three trillion but uh, we should work on the holes, make sure our state and local governments get the help they need. They need that now because they fronted a lot of the costs for this uh, COVID epidemic so far. Federal government needs to do more there. On the subject of health care, Senator Bernie Sanders and Representative Jay Appel from Washington have introduced a bill that would guarantee health care for all Americans for the duration of the coronavirus pandemic. Would you sign on to that bill? Well, I haven't seen the bill yet, so I'd have to take a look. But, you know, I've been in favor of universal access to health care since I first came to Congress. The Affordable Care Act, for the first time ever, uh, made sure that not only low-income people, but people that were working their way up the economic ladder could have access uh, to health care, too. Uh, the subsidies uh, are a lifeline for a lot of folks. I've had so many folks say, Kurt, I didn't like that darn Obamacare, but uh, I really like that Affordable Care Act. It's been a lifeline for me and my family. Uh, and I think that's the what we need to do. We need to fix that. Uh, I fought hard against the repeal effort by a lot of misguided Republicans uh, that didn't understand how popular it was. Uh, West Virginia, a very red state, boy, I tell you, my West Virginia colleagues, both sides of the aisle, got an earful about how important that stuff was. 
So that let's work with something that can actually happen. Again, you know, I'm all about being as progressive and thoughtful and, and 21st century as we can, but you need to bring the rest of the country along or it's not going anywhere. Your opponent in the primary is running ads saying you're representing corporations. And according to the Open Secrets website, more than $900,000 of your campaign money has come from businesses and that only 11 other House Democrats have received more money from big business in this election than you have. How do you convince voters with that kind of money that you're not beholden to special interests? Well, just look at my voting record. Uh, prescription drugs is a huge issue. The cost of it is uh, getting out of sight. Uh, I led the charge uh, in the last Congress and now in this Congress to, re to reduce the cost of prescription drugs for folks. The only bill that passed in the last Congress was one I authored with a colleague of mine, a Republican from Florida, that went after the Martin Sher Kellys of the world trying to rip people off. That's wrong. So if the prescription drug companies or these big corporate interests think they own Kurt Schrader, they're getting a pretty bad deal. On the subject of climate change and addressing climate change, your political ads mention a bipartisan bill that you're sponsoring to bring down greenhouse gas emissions in the power sector, but it allows those companies 10 years to meet carbon emission standards. Critics cite the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that said we now have, well now, 11 years to prevent irreversible damage, that we need to start now, not 10 years from now. What's your response? My bill does start now. Uh, what we do is uh, when this bill passes, uh, all power plants in the country, no matter what their source of energy is, uh, are on notice that they've got to start that trajectory down, show that their emissions are going down. We don't wait 10 years and give them a pass fail. As, as we go through this process, hopefully investing in robust technologies, innovation that's a hallmark of America to help hopefully draw down our carbon emissions in all sectors of the economy, but particularly power plants, we can show that trajectory is being lowered. So we're going after them right away. And it is the only bipartisan bill, Laurel, that has a chance of passing, that has support from business, has support from the environmental community. Again, you can throw the slogans around all you want, but you actually have to figure out a way to get something done. And that's where I do a great job. And that's why the folks I think should reelect me. Well, on that note, Congressman, just 30 seconds left for a final message for voters. Uh, Re-elect Kurt Schrader if you want to get the job done. If you want someone that really represents the 5th Congressional District in all its diversity, and I love that. I mean, we're a microcosm of this country. And if we can get stuff done for our district like I've done, I feel optimistic about our future. I'm very impressed with how Congress has stepped up in this first month of the horrible crisis, passing big bills with a lot of money, trying to help Americans. We're doing it together. That's what it should be all about. This is not a parliamentary system in our country. We have a representative form of government. I'm proud to represent the 5th Congressional District. Congressman Kurt Schrader, thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. Thank you, Laurel. And when we come back, we'll talk with Democratic challenger Milwaukee Mayor Mark Gamba and find out why he thinks he would best represent Oregon's 5th District. We're back in two minutes.